Uh, hello everyone, uh, my name is John Murphy. Uh, I work for Kmart Australia in the servers and storage team. Uh, my job is I do a little bit of Windows, a little bit of Linux, and a whole lot of network monitoring. Um, so today I'm here to talk to you about rational configuration design to prevent irrational problem solving. Um, this discussion, and it is a discussion, it's sort of very philosophical in nature. Uh, we sort of go through, I think everyone, the first time they do a Nagios deployment, they get it wrong. I know I did like three times, uh, to be honest. And it takes a little while before you eventually work out what works for you. So I'd like to introduce you to a sort of uh, a, a technique that I use, and it should be suitable, I think, for most uh, medium to large sized organizations. Um, now, there's no, because it's sort of a philosophical discussion, there's no right or wrong answers. Uh, what works for me probably isn't going to work for, say, a consultancy, where you've got a lot of distribution in your network and a lot of distribution in uh, where those sort of, uh, that monitoring is going to take place. Uh, for Kmart, obviously, we have stores, but it's, it's still a very sort of different environment and a different dynamic in how you're deciding where to send those alerts to and how you've got to configure your services and your hosts. Uh, so, let's, uh, let's dive into it. Uh, I'm going to talk about two separate topics. Uh, in the basic topic, we're going to talk about the relationship between your contacts, your hosts, and your services. Uh, now, it's very important that I put contacts at the top of this list. Uh, I firmly believe that the contact is probably the most important of the three objects. Uh, to understand why, we're going to begin by putting on our web developer hat, perhaps our web developer scarf. <laughs> I don't have any more web developer gear. This is uh, sort of all I have. Uh, so, so the most important aspect of Web 2.0 development is what? Don't, don't, don't everyone jump off a what? The hat. It's not the hat. <laughs> it's close. Close enough. It's the hat. Um, the most important aspect is, you know, making it nice and user-friendly and usable, you know, all those fun little Ajax objects, the swishy thing as it loads stuff and those, those nice little animations while it, you know, fades to the next page. It's all those, those niceties that make it easy for the user to sort of see what's going on. Um, the next and second most important rule of uh, our Web 2.0 development is what? It's the scarf, absolutely right. It is the scarf. And it's also that if we have time, we might actually make the application work. So we'll go through sort of hosts and services. Uh, once, we, once we get past that, we'll uh, look at some more advanced concepts. I use the term advanced rather loosely here, but advanced in terms of, you know, above contacts, hosts, and services. And we'll talk a little bit about the parents and the dependencies. Uh, we'll talk about managing exceptions in your configuration, and we'll talk about automation. Uh, most of this sort of stuff, we'll just be going through some, some little real-world examples uh, that a lot of you are probably going to encounter or encounter similar situations. So as I go through the basic configuration, I want you to keep this little diagram in your head. Uh, we have a Nagios server. We have some network stuff. We have an Exchange server. I presume you have more in your network, but for this, let's just, let's just keep it simple. And we have some users who are interested in our network things and some users who are interested in our Exchange server. Uh, this is pretty much a standard team environment, right? You have your server group or your Linux team and you have your network team and you have your middleware team. And they all sort of only care about their little corner of the IT world. So let's begin talking about contacts. Uh, when I talk about contact objects, there's actually two very important distinctions I like to make. Uh, the first is an actual contact. Now that is a contact object that has an email address or an SMS or a ticketing system integration or a pager if your company hasn't left the 90s yet. Um, that's an actual contact object where information is going to go somewhere. The other object, a contact object, is an actual user object. Uh, that's just a, simply a contact that's a stub for matching a login user. Why you're actually going to do this, I'll sort of get into a bit more. I think a few of you, some of the more advanced users, probably already know where this is headed. Uh, it contains no contact information. It never gets notified for anything. 
So let's begin with the contact definition. Uh, it's all pretty standard stuff. I dare say most of you have seen this 100 times before, so I won't dwell on it. We have a contact. It belongs to a contact group. It has an email. Uh, it has a template with all the sort of normal stuff you'd see in a template. Uh, and we have a contact group. Uh, I'm sorry, a, well, yes, a contact group that that user belongs to. Uh, now, you'll see that it's actually defined what the, where, uh, the relationship between the contact and the contact group in the uh, contact object. Does anyone want to hazard a guess at why that might be? Uh, OK, I'll take that as a no. Uh, the reason why we want to do that is automation. It's simply automation. It's also not so automation for these particular contact objects, though you may want to if a new particular distribution group gets created, you may want to automatically then create a contact object. It's a lot easier to do that and to modify uh, from the actual contact configuration because you can just dump that config file and then load that into XI. Or if you're just using Nagios Core, you can just dump the config file. You don't have to worry about extracting stuff from the database and then messing with it and then re-putting it into the database. Or you don't have to worry about opening up the contact group file and then trying to append things to a particular line. It's much simpler to just, you know, generate the contents of a file and put it down. Uh, so you'll notice there's also in the contact group there is a there is a, another contact group defined. We'll talk about that a little bit more in a second when we talk about our user. So let's just assume we have a brand new Nagios set up, and as far as login is concerned, we're just using the HT password file, the standard Apache HT password file. Uh, now, we're going to pretend we have in that HT password file a user called bu-js murphy. That's just, you know, a login account that I type in my username and password, and I get into Nagios. So we'll create a contact called BUJS Murphy, and we'll put that in the contact group VG team. And you'll see over here we have another template specifically for our users, which just basically says this will get nothing ever. This will never send a notification. It doesn't even have an email address. So what will happen is we'll take that VG team and we'll put that together with uh, our CG main that we saw before. Now, I'm assuming here that the actual email or SMS or what have you address that's attached to that CG main object is um, going to be related to a team of some sort. So let's say in this instance, it's VG team. That's the team that's related to whatever email address it was we defined before. Um, now, once we take that CG main, and we attach it to you know, a template or a service or whatever else you want to attach it to, we're going to get a bit of a flow on effect. Because when a user logs on and it matches a contact object, then it will only allow that user to see the objects to which they have been assigned. This is a really cool feature of Nagios, and it's one that uh, most new users and even intermediate users find quite surprising when they first learn about it. Uh, it basically gives you the ability to do role-based access control in any other terminology or technology. Um, so I think that's a pretty cool feature. But we can sort of go one step further with this, because who wants to create a, H, a user in the H, uh, HT password file you know, for everyone who might potentially use Nagios, which in my case, that's sort of our entire IT department. So there's, a, there's quite a few people in there that you know, need to log in and need to be able to see when stuff's down. So, uh, oops, wrong way. Uh, so we can actually go one step further, and this is for our um, core users. For XI, there's actually an LDAP and an AD plugin. You can just use that, and then this will make all the magic happen for you, and you don't need to worry about it. But for our core users, uh, if we can just use the Apache LDAP module and put in the information to connect to your dame, uh, domain controller and uh, tell it where it needs to find the users and all the other relevant information. You might want to create uh, an access group like I have down in the very bottom of that config. And when that user logs in with their LAN credentials, we can then match that to the user content.